All right. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, chapter 17, dimensionality reduction. Uh, we're skipping 16 because it doesn't exist yet. Um, and it, I found it was really interesting to read this chapter after we've been away for a bit and things have changed because this is really the recipes chapter, which we already had. It used to be there was a recipes chapter earlier and now there isn't. And this is the chapter where they're like, well, if you're not using workflows, I guess you need a way to do recipes. So here's this chapter. And also we'll talk about dimensionality reduction, but I thought it was really an interesting framing that, oh, this is really how to use recipes. And then here's a reason to use recipes while we're at it. Um, so on that note, uh, the learning objectives I picked out, um, I just put in one learning objective that is that kind of overall um, create, prep, and bake recipes outside of a workflow to test or debug your recipes. Um, that was something they really wanted to show you how to do, which we did in chapter, I don't know, seven or eight or something when it was originally there. Uh, then we're going to look at, or we're going to compare and contrast dimensionality reduction techniques, which are techniques used to create a small set of features that capture the main aspects of the original predictor set. And then those techniques are, we're gonna use PCA to reduce dimensionality. We're gonna use PLS, we're gonna use ICA, and we're gonna use UMAP to reduce dimensionality. And then we'll use those techniques in conjunction with modeling, modeling techniques. All right. So this is a, a review for cohort one, um, but depending on when someone's watching this, probably not a review for them because they I think rightfully don't introduce recipes as a separate package um, earlier in the book anymore. Uh, normally you use them as part of a workflow, but you can create a recipe um, and then prep and bake it. And prep is analogous to fitting. It's where you are taking the training data to teach the recipe how to apply itself. And then bake is you're applying the recipe to any uh, new data set or technically to the original data set. Um, something I did find interesting is you can take a prepped recipe and add a step and then prep it again. And it only has to prep that last step. And I didn't know that. And that's, I don't, I don't have a specific use case, but it feels like I could. Like, you know, if you have common shared prepping, you can do that prep all once and then different tweaks on the recipe you do just at the end on, on that one prepped thing. Um, especially with some of the uh, NLP stuff that I work on, you know, applying the NLP is really a recipe step a lot of times. It's feature engineering more than it is model fitting, and it takes a long time. And then we might do random other things after that. So it was interesting to see that you can prep it and then prep it again, and it doesn't have to rerun the earlier prep. So um, I don't I don't think that was possible the, the last time I was kind of experimenting with ways to play with recipes. So um, anyway, so then on to like the specific um, dimensionality reduction techniques, which is what the chapter was about. Um, and here, I, a lot of this, I just uh, copied her code and kind of made sure it still ran nicely. And um, learned some things along the way doing that. So the, the base level of dimensionality reduction is principal, principal component analysis. This is the one that I um, am most familiar with. And it acts on the data without any regard to what the problem is. And so, you know, talking about those NLP problems that you might use something, you know, uh, something like BERT, and you convert your text into like 786 columns of pretty much meaningless numbers. Um, something like PCA is interesting to look at because it's just figuring out what do those columns mean without regard to what your particular problem is, just what kind of features are being extracted in those columns and what what is the most different between different rows of data um, based on com combinations of those columns. Um, and I know this is, you know, she chose a data set that it works for, but it, it was really cool to see that, you know, the first two components pretty well divide up the data. Like you could almost just using that. And it's interesting because it's not, I mean, it's 
trained on the data, but not trained on the problem. So it's kind of just seeing the problem when you extract these principal components. It's like, the, this is where the variability is. And of course, you know, not of course, but not that surprisingly, the variability is between different beans, different types of beans. Um, and so when you uh, look at the, the first two, um, like most, uh, the, the things that capture the, the top most variability and then the second most variability, those are pretty much enough that you can uh, classify the beans. Um, let's see if there's anything else really particularly interesting here. I don't know, did anyone else have any thoughts or comments on that? I'd never seen plot validation results before. That's a very cool function. Oh, th so this was one that she defines in the chapter. Oh, okay. I'll have to, um, I'll have to find that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it uses um, some stuff from, um, uh, was it Learn Tidy Models? They have a package that is for Learning Tidy Models, um, which I hadn't installed before, and I'm definitely going to be playing with more because uh, I still uh, feel like I, I could you know, really cement this stuff better. So, um, yeah, the, the the plots that it comes out with are really clean and pretty um, to kind of demonstrate what's going on here. You know, you can see this is, you know, these squares are just like um, what's going on in that principal component. And you can see how this one is like really, you know, the first principal component really does a lot of separation all on its own. Second one does a little bit of different separation and then three and four and, you know, five, six, I don't remember how many factors are going into this, but um, that is something that they didn't specifically talk about that I learned from the uh, uh, Practical Stats for Data Scientists book that, you know, the number of possible principal components is the number of ver uh, features that are going into them. It's basically re uh, reconstituting those features. So there are really, uh, I don't know, 12 or however many features there are in this data set are possible. But the further you go to, down the number, the less interesting those principal components become. So the next one is partial least squares. And like I said, I would only ever, like I've worked with PCA, I've poked at UMAP and these two in between, I'd never really done anything at all with. And PLS is, pretty cool because it's PCA, except you're telling it what your outcome is that you care about. And so it just does a little bit more separation um, by whatever you're looking at. Now, I, uh, I didn't time it or anything, but I assume that means it's a little slower than PCA, or at least you'd have to run it for each problem that you have. PCA, you just do once on that data set or on that you know set of features, and it kind of defines how those features break down. Um, you could, I mean, with new data, you could decide to change the way you're doing PC, uh, PCA. But anyway, the point being PLS is very specific to your problem, but it is very specific to your problem. And so it does a little bit better job separating by class. Um, again, it's really straightforward with this step PLS. Um, in, you know, PC, step PCA, you just give it the predictors that you care about and how many components you want. Step PLS, you add the outcome into that. Um, otherwise, it's the same straightforward approach. And you know, I can flip back and forth. You can see a little bit better separation up in that in this plot right here, um, but pretty close to the same for this data set. Um, something that is like it feels like getting into three and four they're kind of doing more in the PLS. Three and four stopped being that important, um, stopped giving you much more information. Whereas these three and four, it looks like they're doing a little bit more separation. Maybe, maybe I'm just seeing that, imagining that. All right. Then the next one was um, ICA or independent component analysis. Um, <laughs> I do not follow at all exactly what makes this different. Um, it can be thought of as maximizing the non-Gaussian Gaussianity of the ICA components. I, I, some people might be able to think of it that way. I don't know what that phrase means. So, um, 
that one I did find, I might have to like poke at that a little bit. I didn't find this explanation that compelling to really explain what the difference is. And in this particular data set, ICA doesn't really do much. And so this section, I kind of went, okay, uh, all right, <laughs> no, I'll come back to that at some point because you know it, it's it's trying to make um, the components as statistically independent from one another as possible. Like that phrase kind of makes a little bit of sense, but exactly what that means, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Did anyone have any, or for either from this or from elsewhere, <laughs> more info thoughts on that? I don't have any extra insight, but I, I, I think it's curious because you said it tries to reduce, sorry, as statistically independent as possible, right? Mm -hmm. PCA is also you know, designed to be, um, what's the word? Those, those components are orth or orthogonal to one orthogonal. another. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yes. So what's the difference between orthogonal versus... And I, I don't think PLS has to be orthogonal. It it's or or ICA. They have some other way of getting to number two and three. Where where PCA picks the widest is one, right? And and then does this right hand rule to get the the second one. I, I don't think the others are constrained by number two or number three being orthogonal. Okay. Uh, that again, like all of this kind of like I get a little bit of a feel for what it's what it means, but at some point I'm probably going to just have to go, you know, it's not like they were trying to really teach ICA, like they don't teach us how to do it other than use step ICA. And I'm going to have to go read about it because uh, it did not click for me. And I, I mean, I guess part of the idea in what they're showing us is, you know, you can try it. And maybe it'll help separate out your data and give you useful features. And they show us how we can do that. But I would, um, and you know, I think they would agree that I would like to understand better <laughs> what I am applying. Um, I could use it, but I don't know what I'm doing when I use it really, other than doing PCA kind of, except it's a little bit different. Um, so, and again, like for this particular data set, it didn't really uh, seem that useful. Um, although I guess like kind of down here at three versus four, you get some pretty good separation. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I thought Even that you... was interesting. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. No, you can go. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that three and four would have more separation than one and two was a little confusing to me. Um, it's independent of the classes, though. So it's the oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so it's picking it. Basically, what it's saying is it's picking out features that aren't as like species specific um, in the data, whatever that means. So maybe it is doing things that tend to be more in class um, differences. Like it's it's better at picking out the difference between two beans but not really at picking out the difference between two species of beans, something like that. Um, yeah, uh, so this is one that I wanna read about more to get a better understanding. And you know, like I say, from what we get to in the modeling section, I could try it now. <laughs> I just wouldn't know what I'm really doing, but I, I could throw it into a workflow set and uh, see if it helps. So there's that, all right. And then the last of the techniques um, is UMAP, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. Um, this, uh, it's, it's again, kind of, it's, it's making, finding features that are as statistically independent from one another as possible. Oh, nope, sorry, that's, never mind. That was, uh, I didn't copy, or I didn't fix the text. <laughs> ah, so no, this is making a, a, a like a DAG, um, and then it like separates uh, the graph. It's a, it, it's a much more complicated algorithm, number one. This one takes time when you run it. And I again, I don't, uh, 
fully understand how this works, but I know it's um, kind of, I think of it at least more as it's like separating it in, um, in the feature space that the features are in. So if you think of this, the features as some high dimensional space, it's trying to make clusters within that high dimensional space and then pull those clusters as far apart as they can be. Um, exactly what that means, I don't know. I, I do know that um, something I have heard about when you do uh, UMAP uh, projection is that the visualizations tend to be more meaningful than the visualizations of PCA. Um, but exactly what that means, I guess I don't, I can't really say. And I showed like, um, I, oh, I'm looking at the wrong, uh, wrong slide. So um, the one I show here is that it can be, um, it can depend on the outcome or, it, or not. It has algorithms for both. The one that depends on the outcome takes a little longer, but does a really good job at uh, separating things. Um, So, or at least at visually separating things. Um, again, I don't really, I don't understand the details of how it works, but I, I, I didn't feel as lost in this one because at least I could see that it did work. Um, whereas the uh, ICA, I, I don't really get. And again, ignore my note there because I, just forgot to delete some text there. Um, so yeah, anyone have any thoughts on the uh, the techniques? Because that that's the four. That's kind of the meat of the chapter as far as uh, what we've done is concerned. In in every case, the input was normalized, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't show that code. Um, oh, because I figured we could just hop over here and look at it if we really want to. So. Um, the base recipe uh, does uh, zero values normalization or this order normalization and then normalize. This is from um, the, the best normalize package. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted to click. So yeah, they all have this up ahead. And this is that example where you can, you know, you could prep this recipe and then add steps to it and then prep after that. And so all of that normalization is just done already. You don't have to rerun it every time. Um. And yeah, so that uh, normalization is doing things like this. <laughs> Mathematically, again, I don't really know exactly how it does it, but I trust it. <laughs> it seems well coded. Um, let's see. Well, one of my thoughts reading this was, well, I guess to, to go back a step. Yep. When you're up at the recipe, these are on the training data. Is it? Yes. So, obviously, you're not. I mean. I, wouldn't, I don't want to say overfitting because I don't think it's overfitting anything. But the reason, you know, is the reason that they look so visually separated on the plots because, you know, in a sense, you that's the data it was trained on, right? Like looking at, especially the ones where you're looking at an outcome. Right. Um, so, well, so for uh, PLS, and the, the UMAP that I show, yeah, like that definitely does factor into it. But PCA doesn't know the outcome. Now it is, it's training on the training data for sure. And it's, you know, learning how to separate the features it sees in the training data, but it's not separating them by class, it's separating them by variability. And so, it should be relatively safe, but it is, and I guess that is something worth stressing. That's why they show it in this chapter, that it is something that has to train on some data. And then if you want, you know, you want it to be uniform, you train it and then keep applying it the same way. So you're picking out the same components, the same principal components out of the test or the, um, you know, out of test data or any new data 
that, that you picked out in the training data. So you're combining the features in the same way to create those new principal components, um, which is why it's in recipes because you prep it and that like teaches it, what does PCA mean for this data set or for this, whatever, this family of data sets. And then when you bake it, you can apply that, that same PCA, um, which I learned because we were trying to visualize some, some again, uh, some NLP stuff that we project it down to the first two principal components and can visualize uh, the word train and how BERT can take train from different senses and it puts train to mean teach in one place and train to mean uh, the vehicle in another place, even though they start in the same place. Um, and so we did that with principal components, but you have to be careful that you're applying it the same to all of the sentences because otherwise the principal components of a different data set would be different. Um, and so all that is to say that recipes takes care of that to make sure that you're, you're doing it the same way for everybody. Um, so yeah, there is, you know, definitely like on, on this one here that you're giving it the class and the, the data it's looking at is the training data. And so it's trying to find how to separate the training data as well as it can. Um, it would be interesting. Oh, actually, uh, that's right. So I should have should have shown that function because I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. So it is using the validation data when it plots it. Oh. Yes, that is Very, important. Okay, that is important because that, that's yeah. the heart of my question. Right. Yep. Yeah. So that is the validation data, not the training data. Good call. Um. So if, if you go back to the the chapter in Oops. in uh, uh, like seventeen point five, maybe I think there's a, a plot. Well, hold on a sec. Hold that thought. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all right, and, and my numbers don't line up, but this is um. So the modeling part, uh, I don't show all the code, and maybe we'll jump back to the code, the chapter to see the code. That the general idea is they're setting up a tuning grid, and you've got um, basic PLS and uh, UMAP. So basic is basically you don't do um, any sort of dimensionality reduction. And then they did PLS and UMAP just as samples. And I got to check that because I think uh, UMAP is with the, yeah, the type that has the outcome. And so basically they're, they're doing the two types of pre-processing that know about the outcome when they're pre-processing. So you're training your model to pick out the important features for, for this data. And then they do a bunch of different models. Um, and part of the idea is exactly what models they're doing. Um, kind of doesn't matter. Like they're just doing a bunch of them. And then uh, they, you know, map it out to, to try uh, to find the best, uh, the best model out of all of that. And I, I did make one change that Julia has the, the plot on a scale of 0 0.93 to 0 point or to one, um, 0 0.92 to one, I guess. I put it on a scale of zero to one because I wanted, I wanted to stress what she talks about a little of, they're all basically fine. Like they're, they're basically the same. Um, I did find it interesting uh, like you can see, you know, look at purple that you can see basic to UMAP to PLS or paint the, the multi-layer perceptron, the neural net, basic uh, UMAP PLS. So in, for all of these, well, not all of these actually, because um, this is for the discrim flexible, basic, you know, like doing the um, dimensionality reduction makes it worse. Um, but yeah, she she talks about like this is um, we're getting into the part. This is why it's one of the like kind of extra chapters. Is this helps when it helps, but a lot of times it's just going to do a little tiny, tiny update, a tiny improvement. Um, and if you know, even when you space it way out on you know zoom way in on the plot, it's not that different. It's basically flat for big sections of this plot. Um, 
But part of the other point is that workflow sets, you just can do it. You just set it up, you run it, and it'll tell you which combination works the best for this particular data. Now you might be, you know, I mean, they've got a validation set in there. So hopefully you're not overfitting too much. Um, it was pretty straightforward to do it. I, I did like, I got kind of obsessed with actually running this and I had a bug and uh, made it through that bug that the problem was something they already fixed in, in embed long ago, but it hasn't been released on CRAN yet. Um, so at least if you have the same setup I do, I haven't worked out exactly why it fails, but it will crash if you try to run the, their code and it was consistently doing it and it was the UMAP code, everything else ran fine. Um, and it just UMAP modeling code. But anyway, so that's the chapter. Um, the the real key takeaways, oops, are uh, going back to, like I said, what we had already seen of this, that you, you know, you, you set up a recipe when you're doing workflow sets as well, uh, or workflows as well, um, but you don't prep and bake. And the idea is you can still do this prepping and baking to kind of explore your data. Um, this is one of the key times when you would do it now, because it's just to see what does what do these steps do to my data, not how much do these steps help me make a model. Um, it is a lot faster to do prep and bake than to also fit a model a lot of times. So um, that, that is a key thing that we're seeing here. And then also that there are these different dimensionality reduction techniques. They're super easy to apply. Like, I think you would always use almost exactly the same code. Like you can choose how many components you actually want to have as the outcome features or the not outcome, but you know, the resulting features. Um, there's also, uh, you can also tune those components. Yeah. I remember we found that in a very early chapter. It kind of feels like it belongs here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, you absolutely, I assume, right? You just can mm -hmm. tune the number of components. Tune the number of components. So um, yeah, I'll bet that that's no longer in that earlier chapter. Although It, I, it is, I, I, looked, okay. I looked for it. Yeah, it's like chapter, let me find it, 13, I think. Oh. Ah. Oh, in a grid search. Okay, that probably, that makes sense. Um, yeah, num comp, comp equals tune. So that's, yeah, so you're tuning it to see what results, this is within the workflow, right? Yeah, so what results in the best uh, outcome, the or, you know, the best predictions. Um, so, I do like how easy it is. I, I do wish I understood this one better so I would know when to try to apply it. Um, so that's something I still need to work on uh, possibly in the next book club that we're starting. So we'll see. Um, I, I think to your point that there wasn't very much gain in some of the, you know, between some of the models or it might depend on which model technique that you're using. I think that's something I'd like to learn more about is, you, you, I think like the, the bagged, I, I could imagine tree models not needing this as much. So I, did, I, I don't I don't have any real insight into that. I mean, the, the MLP, you know, the neural net that they're training here. Oh, um, I'll get to your questions in a second, Daniel. But, um, you know, the, the MLP that is, easy to do through um, tidy models is pretty basic. But one of the things that a lot of neural net people like to say is, oh, you don't really have to do much feature engineering. The neural net figures out the features. And if you look at this, it's one of the ones that benefited the most from uh, doing some dimensionality reduction before going into the model. Now, again, it's a, you know, it's one layer and it's not quite the same as deep learning, but um, I thought that was interesting how much it mattered there, that and the uh, was it RDA. Um, so yes, I think Daniel was trying to help me understand the ICA difference. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was trying to do. Um, I, I guess it was 
but the first statement was about um, like the orth or using orthogonal projections for PCA, and it's essentially just maximizing variance. That's really all it's like trying to do. Right. And I guess like I guess orthogonal is another way you can <laughs> say that. Um, but I, but yeah. Um, I guess my actual question was how useful is actually tuning the number of principal components versus like just looking, looking at it, looking at elbow plots or like some other like graphical heuristic. Um, I, I don't know because elbow plots also have a lot of, uh, you know, deciding exactly where the elbow is can be pretty, um, uh, 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 just depend a matter of opinion. So what I would say is if I were tuning PCA, I would probably look at the plot and say, oh, I probably need three to five of these components. And then you can set the tune within that. Because a lot of times it is, well, I say a lot of times, it's not like I've done PCA thousands of times, but I think every time I've done it, I'm like, yeah, well, the first two are definitely useful. Eh, the third one might be useful fourth one's probably not useful so like i think that's where you would tune is that stuff where you're just kind of taking a guess at what would be useful um but yeah i i wouldn't tune you know if you've got 700 features that you're trying to use pca to re reduce i wouldn't tune between one and 700 <laughs> you know <laughs> take a plot decide what's likely to be useful and then include that range in your tuning. Something that I think could be potentially useful that I haven't had much success using myself is if you tune the number of components alongside the, the step correlation, because I know that you know, PCA in particular is supposed to do better without highly correlated features. Right. So what I tried to do was, you know, for varying levels of correlation, like take out you know, anything that's below a 50% correlation, then try PCA or 75% correlation, try PCA. I, I didn't have very much success with it, but I feel like it's something that might be promising. Uh, I could see that. That logically makes sense, but I, I yeah. don't know. Um, oh, another a thing that I didn't uh, include in my slides that I thought was interesting when I was going through was where was this that um learn tidy models has this uh top loadings plot top loadings function which actually they have a i think they have a pull request on it to just sort so that's easier to see but the idea is that you can look at after you do the pca so pc1 is i mean it's a lot of things these are the top five things that go into it and it's going to soon be sorted to show you which are the things that in, that go into PC1 the most, and then what goes into PC2 the most. Um, that is a very interesting function to me when you're trying to extract meaning or, or try to understand like what is this high dimensional space really, or what might it really be telling you? You know, so PCA can help you see that. Um, so. I just thought that was interesting to look at. Uh, it reminded me of um, the practical stats for data science did the same sort of thing in the PCA chapter, showing you what were the components made out of. And it's a useful thing to look at sometimes, especially, you know, like going back to um, if you're tuning the, the number of components that you're going to use coming back and kind of understanding okay i chose five what what did those five mean <laughs> like what were those one you know what were they combining and could i get just as much maybe by oh look the first five components are all made up of the same features so let's just throw away the rest of the features something like that um i just thought this was all pretty interesting especially when it comes to model interpretation at the end i know the next chapter is about it but <laughs> you know for a what you know, you described as this kind of a small gain there on that last plot. You, I think you lose quite a bit of interpretability because then you have to take it back to a PCA versus, you know, the next chapter is going to get into Daleks, I think. And, and you can almost see how each component 
affects the prediction versus when you've got these PCAs, I think it'll be harder to get at what's the exact impact of this factor right. on my outcome because you have to go through the PCA first. Right. That's true. Um, yeah, like everything or not everything, but things <laughs> often come back to PCA because PCA is relatively simple yeah. to run. Like um, it can, it is something with a small enough data set that you can calculate by hand. Like it's not something that is insanely um, uh, just intense to do. Um, but you're, you know, it is, okay, I'm going to take pieces of all of these different components and, and combine them into one uh, new variable that, you know, each of these variables is a combination of the other variables and it's totally obfuscating what they mean. So it's true. Um, yeah, that was something like, it's one of those where, uh, like, I think she does, she talks about a little, a little bit about, you know, what does each of these components mean, but it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, it kind of feels like this PC or PL, well, this PLS in this case, but it is looking at solidity and roundness mostly as far as uh, like the, the size of the value or the importance into this uh, loading. But what does that mean, really? Eh. Um, but it's it's tempting to say, oh, it's looking at the, I don't know, firmness, or or you might give some word to that that uh, loading. Um, dense bean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a dense bean. <laughs> um, it's a a bean that uh, is it's got a gravity to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's round and solid. Anyway. Um, but it was really cool. I like this chapter. I, th I think the visualizations are really nice. Uh, kind of up to the game compared to a lot of the visualizations, actually. So if you're wa watching, Max, I think uh, you need to go back to earlier chapters and now and add some nice, pretty graphics, because these were really nice. Um, and yes, so. That's a whole other can of worms, but that factor analysis is kind of like PCA, but with more meaning um, and more, there's a lot more going on there. Um, so the, the missing chapter be before was embeddings, right? Yes, I mean, uh, I assume so. Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, and so it will, Flow, like I think the order makes sense that you're going to take categorical data that you turn into some high dimensional space and then you reduce that space down into something uh, more manageable. Um, but yeah, so that one's not there yet, but uh, 18 and 19 both are at, at a version. Um, and I think 20 is the one that he was working on tonight. So yeah. Uh, I haven't, I don't think a version of 16 is up yet. So we'll see about that. But I think, you know, we can go for at least a couple more weeks. Um, and I strongly suspect 20 is going to be there by the time we get to it. Um, so, yeah. So I guess with that, um, who wants to do 18? I will take one of the next two chapters. If if that's 18, then, then so be it. I've played with Thalix a little bit, but I'm not sure how much justice I can do. Uh, I had not used <laughs> embed or whatever, you know, any anything yeah. other than recipes that was in this chapter ever at all. So you've got a leg up on me for this next one. So sure, uh, you've got it, Joe. Yep, 18. All right, I'm going to try to... Um, read it and get learning objectives written, but, you know, dive in without that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just saw the, the section name. Beans, beans, uh, beans. Yeah, we're coming back to the beans. <laughs> we're going to explain how the beans uh, come into things. Yeah, so, I'm excited. Awesome. Um, all right, I think that's it then. Um, 
I will see everybody on Slack and uh, see you next week. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.